This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Science at the Theater, Secrets of the Soil, sponsored by the Friends of Berkeley Lab. My name is Jeff Miller, and I'm head of public affairs. Uh, one of the many wonderful features of working at the lab is to be surprised, enthralled, and yes, sometimes humbled by an emerging field of science. Tonight's topic is a perfect example. Who would have thought that the story of soil would contain a cast of characters to rival a Tolstoy novel? Indeed, the story is so rich, and the climate and energy ground we have to cover tonight so vast that we needed five scientists to even scratch the surface. Leading tonight's team is our moderator, John Hart, who's a professor of ecosystem science at Berkeley, a Guggenheim Fellow, and an author of, let me see here, 190 scientific publications, including eight books. One of his books, Consider a Spherical Cow, is a widely used textbook on environmental modeling. Uh, John's particular area of research focuses on climate change and biodiversity. Uh, should I say that he's still a very down-to-earth guy? I guess I won't. Okay. Uh, before John takes charge of the evening, though, a, a couple of closing comments. Please note the fire exits. We don't expect any emergencies, but just in case, please make a note. Uh, as usual, we follow the scientists' presentations and discussion with a question and answer period. There are microphones here, here, and for those of you who are upstairs, there are also some on either, either of the flanks. Uh, please remember to keep your questions specific and short, uh, and we like to move things along. So if you, um, if you would like to ask a second question, please go to back to the end of the line. Uh, lastly, if I may ask who is here for the first time, please raise your hands. Very good, some in the top level too. Uh, please take time to fill out the response cards, the audience survey cards, and return them to a volunteer uh, at the front when you exit. And with that, I will now introduce John Hart. Please welcome him with a warm round of applause. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much for organizing this event, and thank you all for coming. I'm going to introduce the speakers uh, in a row, and then they will get up and talk. But before that, I want to make a few comments. Um, you're going to learn a lot about soil science tonight, but in my comments, what I want to do is try to put soil science into a larger context. When we look around our planet, from the Arctic tundra to the tropics, from rivers to the sea, from the forest to the desert, we see a myriad of splendid detail, a complex mosaic of soil and water, of living creatures arranged in fascinating patterns on the landscape, and of the chemicals and the climate that both nourish and sustain these creatures and these patterns, and in turn are shaped by them. The quote that I'm showing in the upper left on the slide is one of my favorites from the entire scientific literature. Charles Darwin expresses here his confidence that the intricate details of ecosystems will be shown someday to be governed by laws of nature, by universal theory, just as the phenomena of physics are. And so he states that it's so interesting to contemplate. He calls it an entangled bank, but that could be any uh, ecosystem. And he says that uh, if you consider the many kinds of plants and the birds, the insects, the worms crawling through the damp earth, it's interesting to reflect that these elaborately constructed forms, so different from each other and dependent on each other in so complex a manner, have all been produced by laws acting around us. The genius of Charles Darwin was reflected in his capacity to be both an astute observer of nature, 
fascinated by the myriad details, and a scientific visionary capable of conceiving a unifying theory that made sense of all those details and could explain the long history of life on Earth. And so in this quote, uh, Darwin has posed a challenge to ecologists to do for ecology what he did for evolution and the history of life on Earth. Um, the challenge is to develop a predictive and comprehensive theory of ecology, a science of the biosphere. And such a science will have to encompass evolution, but evolution is not enough. And it will have to encompass soil science because soils are inextricably linked, intertwined with everything that happens in nature. The search for this unifying theory of the biosphere is urgent. There's a rapidly increasing uh, threat to our planet from global climate change, from deforestation, mismanaged land use, the spread of toxic substances, and much more. The situation demands of us scientists that we learn to predict the effects of global changes on habitats, on species, and then the harm to society that will result from damaged ecosystems. If the science of the biosphere is to consist, if it only consists of stories, of particular explanations, of particular phenomena, but doesn't lead to comprehensive overarching theory with a predictive capacity comparable to that of, say, the hard sciences, then I fear that ecologists will not be taken seriously. Not the way, for example, physicists are when they testify about whether, let's say, an asteroid is going to hit the Earth. So as you listen to the presentations this evening, I'd like you to pay attention to the ways in which these scientists are working toward achieving that goal. We're not there yet. There's a long way to go, but we're making progress. But ask yourself, are we peering at odd tidbits of fascinating but disconnected detail? Or are we progressing toward an understanding of the secrets of soil that will help us achieve a predictive grand theory of the biosphere? Such a theory will help society develop a reliable strategy for charting a course to a more sustainable future in harmony with the natural splendors of the world. And with that, I want to introduce the speakers. I'll introduce them in turn from right to left, the order that they'll be speaking. And they will get, then get up and make their presentations. Uh, and at the end, as you were told, there'll be an opportunity for plenty of questions. Uh, let me start with Margaret Torn on the right. Uh, Margaret is the head of the Climate and Carbon Sciences Program at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. She studies the natural carbon cycle and human influences on the carbon cycle, which has a tremendous effect on climate and climate change. She studies this through looking at land use and climate change itself. Margaret received her PhD from ERG, the Energy and Resources Group at UC Berkeley in 1994, and I'm proud to say that I was her graduate advisor at ERG. Uh, the next speaker will be Owen Brody. Uh, Owen is a microbial ecologist. His major research interest lies in better understanding the factors that control microbial communities and what happens when these communities change. He received his PhD in microbial ecology from University College Dublin in Ireland in 2001. Trent Northern is our next speaker. Uh, he's a staff scientist at Lawrence Berkeley Lab's Life Sciences Division. Uh, his research aims to construct detailed models of the metabolism and the energetics of cellular communities. He came to the Berkeley Lab in 2008 he, from a, receiving a PhD in uh, biochemistry from Arizona State University in 2006. And our last speaker on the left will be Janet Jansen. Uh, Janet is a senior scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Her research is in uh, the area of molecular microbial ecology and genomics with a focus on soil and marine sediments. 
She received her PhD in microbial ecology from Michigan State University, and she came to the Lawrence Berkeley Lab in 2007. And with that, we'll turn to our first speaker, Margaret Torn. Thank you, John. <laughs> Hello. <clears throat> okay, let's see. In 1937, President Franklin D. Roosevelt wrote, the nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. And he wrote those words during the Great Depression, when erosion and loss of topsoil were making the land so infertile that crops were dying in the field and people were starving. Those conditions were immortalized in John Steinbeck's novel, The Grapes of Wrath, and also in the photos of Dorothea Lange and other photographers who documented the devastation. And I have one of those uh, work project photos up on the uh, screen showing a, a really desolate field that should have had wheat on it. President Roosevelt was thinking about soil as a provider of fertility, for food to eat, for fuel to burn, for fiber for clothes. So he said that as the nation's soils go, so goes the nation. Now, 70 years later, we find soils at the center of a very different environmental crisis. Because it turns out that as the world's soils go, so goes the climate. And in particular, the organic matter in soil has the potential to alter the path of climate change in this century. The pivotal role of soil in Earth's climate is due to its role in the global carbon cycle. So as you know, CO2 is the main anthropogenic greenhouse gas. And uh, plants consume CO2. This is a little hard to see the red. So there's some CO carbon dioxide molecule. Plants consume CO2, make organic material. This is input to the soil when plants die or, or shed leaves. And then in the soil, that material is transformed by microorganisms, the bacteria and fungi that live in soil. And the microbes may also decompose that material all the way back to CO2, so creating a carbon cycle. And this process can take CO2 out of the atmosphere if the material is stable in the soil, but it can also pump CO2 back into the atmosphere if decomposition is accelerating. And to give a feel for the magnitude of those flows in those stocks globally, consider that the natural flow of carbon from soil in soil respirations, that's that microbial decomposition, is about seven times bigger than all anthropogenic activities of emitting CO2, uh, deforestation and fossil fuel consumption and cement manufacturing. And second, to give you a sense of the stocks, I made the soil box and the uh, atmosphere box, those are to scale. There's about three times as much carbon in soil as organic matter as there is in the atmosphere as CO2. So you can tell that even a small change, a transfer of carbon from soil to atmosphere or an acceleration of decomposition would greatly change the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and thus the amount of climate forcing. So one of the most important things that soil do in terms of climate is just to store carbon that would otherwise be in the atmosphere as a greenhouse gas. So let's look at anthropogenic emissions, and I'm just going to use the last decade as an example. So between fossil fuel combustion and deforestation, humans emitted about 9 billion tons of carbon as CO2. But if you, and that's each year. But the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere each year only went up by about half of that. Here it says 47%. The rest of those emissions were actually taken up or removed from the atmosphere through exchanges with terrestrial ecosystems in the ocean. Now, in the ocean, that CO2 forms a weak acid, which can have environmental impacts, and that's a story for another science in the theater. But one half of that sink, of that material that didn't stay in the atmosphere, is going into, taken up by plants and is stored in wood and soil. Excuse me. Let's see if I can go back to that. And that's a very valuable service. Because if we think of climate change as the cost of running our economy on fossil fuels, we're actually getting a 50% discount right now. We only have to deal with half the impact of our emissions because of that sink through natural processes. So I just want to take another look at the land sink. Uh, as you can tell, so plants and soil take up about 25% of our emissions, but the sink is very variable. 
it seems to track climate variability from year to year that's affecting new plant growth and, and soil storage, but we don't actually know the mechanisms of how climate affects this sink, and we don't know in detail where that carbon goes. So can we, can we say with any confidence that this sink will continue, that it can keep pace with our accelerating emissions, until we understand what controls the sources and sinks of carbon, the, the flows in and the flows out, we, we can't say that, and we don't know whether we'll continue to get this, this discount on our emissions, but I'll note that all the climate projections you see assume that we do. So we're sort of being optimistic in that one realm, but we don't know if it's true. Now I want to turn to the other reason that we want to know about the mechanisms. Well, how is it that carbon is stored and lost in soil? And that is because of the potential for soils to release carbon dioxide and form feedbacks to climate change. Now there are many long-term experiments. I thought John Hart would mention his in the Colorado Rocky Mountains, which is warming soil. Here's another one close by at Jasper Ridge across Highway 280 from Stanford. And from these experiments, we're learning something about how soils respond to climate change. And just quite simply, the most important message for this talk is that when you warm the climate, you warm soils, that's pretty obvious. And what we know from the experiments is that when you warm soils, microbial activity increases and their decom the decomposition rate increases and you put more CO2 into the atmosphere. So when it gets warmer, you get more soil respiration of CO2 into the atmosphere. Now, if you get more CO2 in the atmosphere, you get more warming. And if you get more warming, you'll get more microbial activity and more emissions. So that's a positive feedback that is amplifying our initial perturbation of the climate. And when it comes to climate change, what we call positive feedbacks are usually a bad thing, in that this is amplifying the effect of our activities. I wanted to give you a sense of the magnitude. Okay, so soils can form these feedbacks, but how big could this effect be? According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a kind of middle-of-the-road projection of climate change is about three degrees Celsius warming by the end of the century. That's about five degrees Fahrenheit. And this is middle of the pack of projections, but it's a lot of warming in terms of its impact. But based on those ecosystem experiments, we have a rule of thumb for how warming affects soil respiration. So what I did is I plotted the global soil respiration flux versus a warming of three degrees, and you can see that there's a small increase in that, in that over time. Now let's look at, this is showing the anthropogenic CO2 emissions over this century that would give you that three degrees of warming. But what happens if that warming really does cause this amount of increase? So here's what becomes the new CO2 emissions to the atmosphere added to the, added to the atmosphere if it's our direct emissions plus that increase in emissions from the effect of warming on soil. And you can see that what looks like a rather small change in a natural flow, but because that flow is so big, it becomes a really huge effect on the future climate forcing. Now, for most scientists, that three degrees is, is kind of at the upper limit of dodging many climate catastrophes. And this soil feedback then could definitely push us over that limit. And that's why John spoke of the urgency of understanding soils. So an important question is, how accurate is this projection? I used a pretty rough rule of thumb to make this plot because we don't really know how much carbon in soil is vulnerable and what actually will control the rate of release. And so there's a pressing need to know that. Uh, will the response to climate change be larger or smaller than what I have plotted here? So in the past, our view of what controlled soil carbon was rather simple, and it said that soil carbon was controlled mainly by the chemistry of plant inputs and the recalcitrance of human substances. And you don't need to know about that, in part because what I'm saying now is that we know neither of those things are really that important. And that's in part thanks to research by people at Berkeley Lab. So the question remains, why does some soil organic carbon persist in soils for tens of thousands of years, while in other places or times it only lasts a day before being converted by microbes to CO2? So in my research and in the research of many people at Berkeley Lab, we're trying to investigate that question with field work and lab work and collaborating with scientists all over the world. And we're developing new views of soil carbon cycling that we hope will give us a more accurate picture. And in a nutshell, this emerging understanding 
is that we could view the persistence of soil organic matter as an ecosystem property. It depends on the plants, the climate, the parent material, the soil itself, the microbes, and the intricate physical, biological, and chemical interactions among all those things. But unfortunately, this more complicated ecosystem view doesn't give us a simple answer to how vulnerable soil carbon is, but it is putting us in a better position to investigate it. And uh, for example, we have a really exciting new project in Alaska coming up, and Janet will talk about her work in Alaska, sites like these. Another thing this new view does is point to the centrality of microbes, the living beings that are actually decomposing the organic matter. All these processes are carried out by microorganisms. And if we knew what they will do and how they will respond, then we would actually have the answers to our questions. I want to frame the mystery of soils in the words of Leonardo da Vinci, uh, not just a brilliant artist and engineer, but also somewhat of a natural scientist who, con who uh, conducted some pot experiments on soils in the early 1500s, and he wrote, we know more about the movement of celestial bodies than about the soil underfoot. Now, in 1500, European societies did not know very much about celestial bodies and their movement. So this means they didn't know very much at all about soils. So now we know much more about celestial bodies, and I think there have been many great uh, science in the theater talks about them. But the living soils actually still remain a mystery. And to close, uh, I just wanted to give one comment on that. So here's a photo of celestial bodies, the galaxies and so on. And astronomers tell us there are about 100 billion stars in our galaxy. Now this is a photo, not of celestial bodies, but actually of microbes in soil that have been stained with a phosphorescent dye. And on the poster for this event, you saw a handful of soil. And the microbiologists tell us that in a handful of soil, there are about 100 billion cells, or microbes individual microbes. So it's the same amount of stars in the galaxies as there are microbes in just 10 grams of soil. But one difference is that we cannot see these microbes in their native environment, no matter what telescope we make, uh, what probe we have, and we don't know very much about them, and we certainly have to be much more clever to get at them. In fact, many fewer than 10% of these microbes have been cultured to see what there is. It's probably less than 1% have been described of all the different taxa. So we don't know how to predict what they'll do. So let me leave the mystery of soils in the hands of the people who best understand microbes, and the three speakers who follow me um, are all experts in microbial processes around the world. And first is Owen Brody. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Margaret. Um, as John said, I'm a microbial ecologist, and what a microbial ecologist does basically is look at the interactions between microbes, and not just between microbes, but between microbes and their environment. And it's very important to study microbes in their natural environment, and that, that's what we try to do. What I'm going to talk about today is some of our work in tropical soils. Um, I'm particularly interested in tropi tropical soils because Microbes in tropical soils are incredibly important in terms of the carbon cycling. Actually, microbes are important in all soils in terms of carbon cycling. Um, but they have a potential to show an, a very large feedback to global climate change. Microbes in tropical soils can also potentially hold the key to our energy future, and I'll discuss a little bit about that. So we know tropical soils and tropical forests are incredibly important for biodiversity, about 50% of the Earth's plant and animal diversity are found in tropical regions. But they're also the most important carbon stores annually on Earth. This plot here, if you look at the green areas, this shows plant productivity. And if you look at the tropical regions, plant productivity is maintained consistently throughout the year in the tropical zones, while it varies quite significantly in uh, more temperate and higher latitude regions. What this means is that these regions store more carbon they're, more, they're active more frequently during the year, so they store more CO2. And this makes tropical regions the largest carbon sink on Earth. However, climate predictions are predicting significant changes in precipitation. If you look at this map here, the tanned areas show where precipitation is predicted to decrease. And if you noted what I showed in the previous video, that a lot of these decreases are predicted to occur in climate regions in uh, tropical regions. Now, these regions were, are uh, historically and have evolved under uh, low variation in rainfall, but now this drought is potentially threatening the, these regions 
and the organisms in these regions are not adapted to variations in rainfall. So this might have significant impacts on the carbon cycle. And the previous slides were models. So these are projections into the future. This, actually, this shows actual data from 2000 to 2009. And what we can see here, if you can see the red areas, this shows decreases in plant productivity. So decreases in plants, most trees in this case, consuming CO2, pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere and acting as a carbon sink. This is occurring in, mostly in tropical regions, and this is resulting in a decrease in, in the magnitude of these sites as a sink. So where does this carbon go? Well, the reason for this carbon leaving the soil is microbial enzymes. And the same way that we use microbial enzymes in our biological uh, detergent to remove uh, ketchup stains or tomato sauce stains of three-year-olds, this is my son, the, the microbes in soil take plant litter, leaves, roots, trees, break that down into smaller parts. And those smaller parts so that they consume and gain energy from these compounds. Some of this material goes into soil as organic matter, some of it stays in soil, and some of it re is released to the atmosphere as CO2. And the magnitude of that CO2 release is controlled by, in, in some part, by the microbes, what types of microbes are present, and how they respond to changes in, in climate, such as changes in rainfall or changes in temperature. And we're very interested in understanding these processes from a microbial point of view. So we partnered with Wendy Silver and Tana Wood from UC Berkeley um, to see how microbes might change in response to a drought effect in a tropical forest soil. Wendy and Tana simulated a drought effect in this uh, forest in, in Puerto Rico. And the reason we're working at this site in Puerto Rico is that there was a 10-year study looking at rates of plant litter decomposition across 28 different sites. And it was discovered that this site in Puerto Rico had one of the highest rates of plant decomposition of all of these sites that were studied. Another reason that we're interested in this site is that it's teeming with microbes. And Margaret mentioned there were uh, 100 billion microbes in a handful of soil. At this site here, we find 100 billion microbes in one gram of soil. And that's about 100 to 1,000 times more, more bacteria in a gram of soil than you'll find in any fertile, so any fertile soil. So my group, Nick Bauskull, and, and also with Christian DeAngelis and Julian Fortney, went to Puerto Rico and worked along with, uh, with Wendy and her group. So how do you look at, how do you study this range of diversity and num an enormous uh, amount of microbes in soil? Well, as Margaret mentioned, we can't use, uh, we can't use satellites. And microscopes are probably about the right scale to, to visualize microorganisms. But the problem is when you look at microorganisms under the, the microscope, this is pretty much the range of shapes and sizes that you see. So we have millions of types of microbes, but a very limited range of shapes. And what makes this problem all the more challenging, as Margaret said, we can only grow a small fraction of these organisms in the lab, so it makes it very difficult to study these. Well, thankfully, in the late 70s and early 80s, Carl Woese and his colleagues, they determined that you could uh, classify and identify most of life on Earth by comparing the DNA sequence of a few common genes. If you look at this box here, this is the metazones, that's where we are, and all animals. Land plants are here, and the rest of this diversity is microbial. So you can see microbial diversity dominates the planet. We tend to think that we're in control of things, but we're not really. In the early 90s, the uh, Department of Energy initiated the Human Genome Project. And this was a, a, a multinational effort. Um, many billions of dollars went into this and culminated in the sequence of the human genome, which is three billion bases after about 10 years of work. This also spawned a new industry and new technologies. And now with the evolution of these technologies, we can now sequence the soil genome or the genome of all the organisms in soil. Um, that's about 300 times the size of the human genome. So the technology to enable this and the development of this technology has outpaced Moore's law and it's been pretty outstanding. So we, can now, we now have tools to be able to understand soil microbial communities, to be able to identify them, and to be able to at least have some insight into what role these microbes perform without the needing to cultivate them in, in the laboratory. So we went to Puerto Rico with Wendy Silver. They constructed these rainout shelters. 
And these are effectively perspex screens that deflect some of the rainfall. So we're simulating a drought effect here, reducing the rainfall or the throughfall by about 40%. We take some soil samples at various depths in soil. And then we've performed some experiments, some low tech using canning jars for incubations, some high tech sequencing the DNA of the microbes in the soil, measuring enzyme activities and various parts, uh, and, various parts and components of the carbon cycle. This generates enormous amounts of data. So we use uh, the computing resources up the hill at Berkeley Lab and also at the Joint Genome Institute. So what have we found? This is an ongoing project, so I'll give you some examples of what we've found so far. In a half gram of soil, we detected more than 4,200 different types of bacteria, and that's a very conservative estimate. With rainfall exclusion, we lost about 15% of that bacterial diversity. But even with this loss of bacterial diversity, we could see that certain groups of organisms increased. And these are actinobacteria. Some of you uh, may have heard of these. If not, you've all smelt them. These are the organisms that give soil the earthy smell, particularly pronounced after a rainfall event. They also produce a lot of antibiotics, but they're major players in soil carbon decomposition. So their increase is potentially very significant. We also identified that the enzymes that degrade plant polymers increased in activity following drought. And some of our work with Trent has shown that the soluble carbon compounds in soil, this is the product of microbial degradation, are very different following drought compared to control conditions. So together, this is telling us that the microbial communities have changed, the carbon cycle has changed. And this work is ongoing. We're following this up. And we'd like to see how long it takes for these microbes to return to the conditions before this drought event, and how long does it take the carbon cycle to reset. Working in places like this, also allows us to develop a, for a fundamental understanding of how microbes work. And we'd like to be able to take that information, not only to understand how microbes affect the carbon cycle, but use those microbes to engineer processes to maybe curb some of the effects of, of climate change. So the, the DOE Joint Bioenergy Institute in Emeryville is currently working on developing uh, biofuels from cellulosic biomass. And cellulosic biomass it's basically the not edible parts of plants, the woody components, the, the, the uh, parts of plants that give it structure. Now, one of the reasons for this is that this does not impinge on food production, and some of these plants, uh, particularly grasses like mis miscanthus and switchgrass, can potentially be grown on, on marginal lands also. But how do you go from this, these woody plants, grasses, to a, bio, to a biofuel and to fueling your, your transportation? Well, it turns out that this point here is really the bottleneck, or one of the, the major bottlenecks, and that's breaking down these plants. These plants have evolved over time to avoid degradation, um, but there are microbes that have specialized in breaking down these polymers. We want to break down these polymers and release them to, uh, as sugars to produce fuels. So what would you do if you were a microbe? Where would you hang out if you were a microbe that specialized in degrading plant material? Well, you've got to think like a microbe. So if you're a homeowner, you don't like the look of these. These are termites. But if you're a microbe that specializes in degrading plant materials, this is one of the places to be. Also, the rumen of a cow, we know that these are extremely efficient at degrading plant materials, and they make a biofuel. It's methane. If we could harness some of that activity, that would be very useful. Or you could, go to, you could live in a tropical forest soil with some of the highest rates of, degradation on Earth, of plant root degradation on Earth. So my colleague, Kristen DeAngelis, traveled to Puerto Rico and decided that she was going to go and capture plant-degrading bacteria. How do you do that? How do you capture plant bacteria? Well, you use bug traps. Just like you capture insects, just like you may capture mice, you use bait. In this case, the bait we use is plant polymers, lignin or cellulose or hemicellulose. And Kristen and, and her colleagues took these porous beads, coated them in lignin. You can see this here. This is a great place for microbes to live. You, you saw the video at the, at, at the beginning. Microbes like these porous structures. So they can hang out in here. They can chomp away on plant polymers. You bury them in the soil. Come back a few weeks later. And then you analyze which microbes grew best on beads with the lignin and which microbes grew best on beads without lignin. So we, again, we use our, our suite of tools, DNA sequencing, and this device, the Phylochip, which we invented to rapidly identify microbes in samples 
look at what enzymes are being produced. And Kristen was able to identify that the beads in, that were coated in lignin were enriched in actinobacteria. Again, these plant polymer degrading microorganisms. And she was able to show that higher lignin degrading activity was, was present in, on the beads that were, uh, in, or that were um, soaked in, in lignin. So where does this information go? Well, obviously, these microorganisms have enzymes capable of breaking down lignin. And this could potentially be used in biofuels. So these organisms and their genetic information is then passed on to other people working at the Joint Bioenergy Institute to more effectively produce enzymes to degrade plant material and hopefully reduce one of the bottlenecks to efficiency in biofuel production. So what I hope you can see is that it's important to understand microbes in their natural systems. These microbes have evolved in nature, and nature has allowed these microbes to become special specialists in particular functions. If we can take advantage and understand the distribution of these microbes in nature, then maybe we can understand how microbes will respond to climate change, how they will affect the carbon cycle with their responses, and potentially how we can use the properties of these microorganisms to mitigate some of the impacts of climate change. Thanks. Okay, well, it's a pleasure to get to talk to you. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about a different type of ecosystem. So Margaret told us how important um, soil microbes play uh, in climate change and in stabilizing soil and sequestering it from the atmosphere. And then Owen told us about tropical soils and their role in uh, cycling carbon. I'm going to shift and talk about uh, these more desolate regions of the Earth, these arid regions where plants don't do so well. And uh, we might think that life doesn't really exist there. Um, they're one of the largest areas of Earth. Um, these arid regions make up something like 40% of the Earth's uh, terrestrial surface. And if you're like me, you like to go there. And while you're there, you're mostly looking at the scenery. You're looking at the beautiful canyons and uh, valleys and you know, seemingly endless landscapes. And you don't look down beneath your feet. But underneath your feet is a whole other landscape. And this is a landscape that's created by microorganisms. And so what we're seeing here are little canyons in the surface of the soil. Um, and these are places where plants don't live very well because there's just a not enough rainfall. There's not enough moisture in these soils. And, but microbes have adapted to live there. So if we could zoom in and look even closer into this soil, we would see these real pioneers these cyanobacteria. So this is um, Microcoleus vaginatus, very old species. Um, the uh, oxygen that we're breathing right now came um, during a great oxygenation event um, that happened by cyanobacteria. They got their metabolism going. The atmosphere was full of carbon dioxide, very low in oxygen. These guys started photosynthesizing and released oxygen um, billions and billions of years ago. And they're real pioneers. You know, they're able to do things completely by themselves. They can take a little bit of dust from the air, a little bit of moisture, uh, nitrogen from the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, and make everything that they need. So I find these absolutely fascinating organisms. And these are major uh, inhabitants of the deserts, if you could only see them beneath your feet. Um, and so here's a picture I took a couple weeks, or it was taken of me and one of the fellows in the lab a couple weeks ago out in uh, northern Arizona. And these are what's called desert biological soil crusts. And I actually brought some samples today. So after this is all over, I'll run up there and you can come see them if you like. Um, these can cover up to 70% uh, of the total surface in, uh, like for example, in the Colorado Plateau in uh, Arizona and Utah. Uh, but they're not plants. These are actually photosynthetic microbes. So they're absorbing the light from you know, the sun, taking whatever moisture they can come by, a little bit of nutrients from the dust, and they're photosynthesizing. And they have their productivity as if you had spread a leaf across the whole desert. So they're very important in these ecosystems. And they've been around for a long time. The oldest uh, fossil records, or some of the oldest fossils, are stromatolites, which are these sort of filamentous cyanobacteria binding to soil particles that are um, as old as 3.5 billion years, ago, years old. 
So in comparison, vascular plants have been around for about 0.4 billion years. So we might speculate that there was a long period of time when these crusts ruled the world and uh, plants had to figure out a way to get up above the crust. And so this is a picture comparing fossilized crusts with the modern crusts and just looking at how their morphologies are very similar. Okay. So, you know, this is, these are regions, and if you visited them, you know, these are the sort of life at the limit of what you can survive in. And, uh, you know, very rarely rains, you know, less than 25 centimeters of water a year. And I'm going to tell you a quick little story. Uh, Owen and I and a couple of colleagues went out to correct, collect some of these crusts. And one of the beautiful thing about them is when they're dry, they're not doing anything. They are completely shut down. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and so if you collect them when they're dry, you can bring them back to the laboratory and you can wake them up. And basically, no time has passed for those guys as long as they're dry. And so we go out to the desert to collect these samples. Um, and what happens? As it, <laughs> it rains. <laughs> And so here we are, madly trying to collect our samples before the rain comes. And you know, it was off in the distance, and we kind of heard some thunder, and we said, there's no way that that rain cloud is going to come towards us. And sure enough, it keeps moving closer and closer. But we managed to get everything um, packed up, and then, you know, pretty soon, it dries out. And so how would you live if most of the time you're dry? You know, metabolism does not happen when there's no water. We need the water for the metabolism. And so these these crusts are comprised of these organisms that can kind of turn their metabolism, turn their li living, you know, active life on and off just as a function of whenever they're wet. And there's many organisms that can turn on and off, but it's some sort of developmental process like making a seed or something like that. And that takes a long time. These guys may be wet for a couple hours or a day, and then all of a sudden they dry out and they have to stop. So that's a very amazing capability. I'm going to show you a little video of these guys waking up right here in this panel. So this is dry sand. I don't know if we could dim the lights a little bit. You might see it better. Um, and oh, there you go. You can see a little oxygen starting to come up here. Yeah. And these guys, they live underneath the sand. And as soon as you wet them, they, even though they're microbes, have the ability to move up onto the surface. And so you'll see it start getting greener and greener as they, as they move along. And so this is one of their adaptations, is that they hide underneath the sand so they can use the sand as sunscreen to protect them from the UV damage. And then as soon as they get moistened, they slide back up onto the top of the surface. And this phenomena of being able to stopping metabolism was first observed by the original microbiology, microbiologist, Leeuwenhoek. So he found these things in his gutter, his rain gutter, he called animolecules. And he'd take the dirt out, and he'd put it underneath you know, one of the first microscopes, and he'd look at it. And when he would wet the dirt, all of a sudden, these little things would come to life. You know, was this spontaneous generation? Was this life happening, uh, coming from, uh, from nowhere? And that raised many theological uh, concerns for a long time. But what that actually was were these little rotifers that could stop, basically desiccate, and then when they're wetted, they could restart their metabolism. So that's, um, and when we think of metabolism, that is thousands of reactions. So one of my particular interests in studying these uh, desert crusts is how do organisms basically turn off? You know, our lives, we live it as a continuum. You're born and you live all the way through. But what would it be like if, you know, one day it rains and you're on and you're living your life and then the next day it dries out and then you don't know what it's going to be like the next time you wake up. You know, are you going to be, is it going to be the winter? Is it going to be dark? Is it going to be incredibly hot? And so these organisms have to be prepared for anything. Okay. So these crusts stabilize the soil. The reason why they're called crusts is that they're very firm. You know, so this is what a piece of crust looks like. And these, this is an actual result of the microbes themselves. So this is that Microcolius vaginatus I showed you. And it's all these little beautiful little necklaces of cells that wrap themselves in this sponge, an exopolysaccharide, that can hold that moisture longer, right? So they keep them wet a little bit longer. But this polysaccharide also sticks to the soil particles. So you can see it's all wrapped around the soil. And it holds the soil together. And I was just talking to a scientist in Washington last week, and, he, and I told him I'm interested in Microcolius vaginatus. And he said, you mean the organism that's holding down the West? <laughs> <laughs> because this, these crusts 
are what really stabilize the soil. And as Owen mentioned, you know, climate change is a real concern in these arid regions because these are already regions that have very low rainfall. These are organisms kind of at the brink. And as you change the seasonality, you know, when it rains, how frequently it rains, what's going to happen to these crusts? And we've already seen some things that are kind of this, like these, uh, the huge sandstorm in, in Phoenix. If you don't have these crusts, the, you have, you're very prone to wind and sand erosion. Um, and you, know, you may have also heard about these huge sandstorms in uh, China as well. So trying to stabilize this crust and understand the climate regimes and areas that will be most susceptible to climate change is very important. And um, we, our project here at Berkeley Lab, like I told you, we go out to the field. Here's Owen right here. Collect these samples. And then we bring them back in the laboratory and we can subject them to different climate, you know, wetting cycles, daylight cycles, temperatures, and uh, study their metabolism in great, great detail. So here we can measure their respiration, we can measure their metabolism, and understand how do they, you know, how do they accumulate carbon? You know, are there good periods? And then under what conditions do they start losing carbon into the atmosphere and maybe start to, to break down? And through this kind of study, we can develop a mechanistic understanding so we could predict and, and have models that could predict how climate change will affect different ecosystems, different uh, desert crust ecosystems. And I wanted to close with this picture here. Um, here's Israel, here's Egypt, and there's this sort of bizarre line right here, and that's the border. Uh, any guesses from the audience as to what's the difference between these two uh, areas here? What, why, why is Egypt white and Israel is this dark color? They're both deserts. Goats, very good. Yes, they graze over on this side. So these crusts are very robust in many ways, but they're not strong against being crushed. If you step on them, they turn to dust and they blow away, and they take hundreds of years to uh, regrow. So being able to predict uh, conditions where they uh, may be sensitive or not is very important so that we can change our land use process, uh, practices and keep that soil, that carbon in the ground. So thank you very much. Okay, so we've heard about the tropics and about the deserts. Now we're going to go north to permafrost. So this is a, a picture of Ala from Alaska, and we're looking at um, a beautiful picture, actually, of permafrost. And permafrost is permanently frozen soil. So it's soil that's been frozen for, for thousands of years. And you can see here this dark purple region is the region in the northern hemisphere that is currently uh, contained or underlain by permafrost soil. So it's, quite, it's, a, it's a huge region of our hemisphere that is, that is underlain by permafrost. Now, now why is this important? That why, why are we interested in permafrost? Well, this is another image of the carbon cycle, and we had a very good introduction to the carbon cycle from Margaret Torn. But, and she explained all of these inputs and net and flexes. But one, one thing that I want to focus on in, and she also mentioned soils. So soils contain a huge reservoir of carbon. So these are 2,000 gigatons of carbon that are currently contained in soils. Now, if we look at permafrost, the permafrost region, is, it has basically trapped a huge reservoir of that soil carbon. So of that soil carbon, a vast amount is trapped in permafrost. So about 960 gigatons of carbon are frozen in permafrost. Now, what happens as the climate warms? Well, frozen things thaw as things get warmer. So this includes permafrost. And as the, perm as the permafrost thaws, that carbon can be decomposed by microorganisms and release greenhouse gases, CO2 and methane. So the permafrost is not so, it's not so permanent. So it's really not permafrost anymore. And there, there are some signs that, that warming is already starting to impact permafrost in the Arctic. So what this um, photo shows here is what's called a drunken forest. So the permafrost underneath the trees have, has started to melt and the trees are, are starting to topple over. So they look like they're drunken. And, and what this woman is doing here is she's lighting methane 
So the permafrost has, has melted and some pools of, of methane are bubbling up from the permafrost and she can just light it with a match and it, it gets a flame. So, so this is the cycle then, and uh, Margaret also already introduced this, but for the Arctic, it's a, it's a huge problem because as the temperature rises, the permafrost thaws, you have the methane and CO2 released, more heat absorbed, and so you have this feedback cycle that is really aggravated. So why am I showing this? Well, I think that this is a very good illustration of what is in permafrost. So maybe you guys have, have heard of, about finding mammoths in, in permafrost. And I think this is the view that, that many of us are more familiar with. Well, it's not only mammoths that are frozen, it's microbes that are also permanently encased in this, or encased in this frozen soil. And so this shows these are green bacteria in soil. So we have mammoths, we have bacteria that are frozen in that environment. So what, what are they doing there? Well, as the, as the permafrost starts to thaw, there's a lot of organic carbon that is frozen and stored there, but it becomes available to these microorganisms that are there. They wake up, so it's similar to the situation we had in the desert crust. These organisms, they're, they're dormant, but as soon as it becomes possible for them to become more active, they can use that carbon and start to decompose it and in the process release these greenhouse gases, CO2 and methane. So what we've done at Berkeley Lab is look at several different sites in Alaska and these are some of, some of the areas we've looked at in central Alaska and they were chosen because they represent different kinds of permafrost. They, they mainly vary with the kind of plant material overlying or the amount of organic matter that is in the soil. And uh, this, we have collaboration with the USGS, and so these collaborators go out with, and they take frozen cores of permafrost, and so we, we want to have it frozen and intact and transported to the laboratory. And then once it's in the laboratory, this is one of my postdocs, and she might even be here somewhere. <laughs> this is Jenny Holtman. But what we, what we want to do is, is ensure that our samples are not contaminated. So when they drill, we can maybe get a little contamination from the drill. So we take back a portion of the cores, these frozen cores, and while they're frozen, she sprays the surface of these cores with these fluorescent microscopic beads and then uh, saws off every surface of the core and then checks in the microscope to see if she can see any of those beads. If she can't find the beads, then we're pretty sure that it's not contaminated. And then we go on. So this is uh, the sort of tools that we're using, and many of us uh, are using these tools. This is something the Berkeley Lab is, is kind of famous for, and it's called um, an omics pipeline. So us, we molecular microbial ecologists like to call things omics. And so you have genomics, proteomics, metabolomics. And, this, and I think this is nicely illustrated in this pipeline here. Um, and depending on the omics tool that you're looking at, you get different kinds of information. So for example, if you're looking at the microbiome or microbiomics, you get information about the community composition. So which microorganisms are there? If we then go to the next step in the pipeline, this is metagenomics. Metagenomics is a tool that you use to sequence all the DNA. So you get your sample, extract DNA, and sequence it. And this is a, a protocol that Owen was mentioning. This is called metagenomics, and that's nice because we get information not only about who's there, but what they're doing. You get their functional genes as well. However, that does not inform about whether the organisms are active. If we want to know whether these organisms are active, we can extract the RNA and sequence what we call the metatranscriptome, and this informs us about which genes are expressed, or the protein, that's the proteome, or metabolites, and this is Trent's specialty to get information about metabolites. So this is just an example of some of our metagenomics studies and each of these uh, represents a gene, different kinds of genes, and these are different samples. And this would be a, a core. And what we see is that just by looking at the colors, if you compare the colors of these uh, genes, so the green, they're less 
abundant, and blue, they're more abundant, you can see that they're different in the permafrost compared to the active layer samples. So there's some differences in the genes. In, so what is the active layer? I should define that. The active layer is the soil on top of the permafrost that is seasonally thawed. So it's called the active layer. So every, every once a year it's thawed, whereas the permafrost does not thaw. So what, what we wanted to know was first which microorganisms were there that in permafrost that had been frozen for thousands of years. That was our first question. And one thing that we found uh, that's very interesting, especially in context of the former speakers, these uh, microorganisms are actinobacteria. And two of our other speakers were talking about actinobacteria. So this is one type of actinobacteria, which is called rubrobacter. And these uh, bacteria are known to be very resistant to radiation and to desiccation. And so what we think is happening is that in this uh, very old permafrost, that these organisms are surviving probably in, in brine films along the soil grains. We also find um, oh, this organism here. So each of these bars represents a different organism, a different bacterium. But this one that we found was in every single permafrost sample that we've looked at. So we think it's very interesting. However, it's never been cultivated. We don't know anything about its properties. We do know that it's there. So the next aim would be to understand more about the physiology of that organism. Uh, one thing that we're very interested in is the methane cycle. And we know that different microorganisms uh, function either to produce methane, so use CO2 and hydrogen to produce methane, whereas others use methane to produce CO2 and hydrogen. So you get a cycle here. So production of methane and using methane as a substrate to produce CO2. But when we looked at our metagenome, so looking at all the DNA from frozen permafrost, we found something surprising. We found a newly discovered methane-producing microorganism. Now, this organism has never been cultivated, but when we looked at all of the DNA from the samples, it assembled into this nice draft genome, and we were, we were very happy to see that. We didn't expect it. So this is a novel methanogen. Its closest relative is about 65% similar. So it's never been seen before, and it's never been cultivated. But because we could sequence all the DNA, we could discover this new organism that is probably responsible for production of methane in our samples. So based on this kind of data, all of these red lines here are supported by looking at DNA. So we just sequence the DNA, and this allows us to understand something about the processes that are happening in permafrost and the active layer. For example, we know that the organic carbon is being degraded. We find genes for that pathway. We also find methane production and also methane consumption to CO2. We, we know that there's trapped methane that is also consumed. And so having this information helps us to fill in some of the gaps in these models um, so that we can, we can get better estimations of the fate of this organic carbon. And so this is my last slide, and I, I wanted to bring us back to where we started uh, with Margaret's talk, because really the aim of a lot of the work that we're doing at the Berkeley Lab is to be able to make better climate models um, and to get better predictive models. Uh, however, most climate models start at this end of the spectrum. You start with the satellite, top-down approach, and try to get information in that way. What we're doing is starting from the bottom up, where you have a lot of information about microorganisms and processes, and environmental data, gas flux data. However, it's very hard to link these two types of data sets together. And so this is a, a huge focus now at the lab, is, is to try to get communication between the climate modelers and, and the people who are producing this very uh, detailed molecular data to get better models. And so I think I'd conclude there. Okay, um, I hope you'll all uh, 
stay if, if you can, because I'd, uh, we're going to have a question period. Okay, a question here. I'm, I guess what I'm saying is I'm hoping that you are soon going to be able to drive that golden spike between the bottom-up and the top-down railroads, because every time I listen to statistics like 79% of the population in the U.S. used to believe in climate change, and now only 59% does, um, it, I wonder if you have any insights into how we can seem to offer the kinds of sure answers that Fox News or Pat Robertson might offer. Um, because every time we say, well, we need to find more before we can really say anything, it seems like we lose a little bit of our credibility and our funding and everything else. It's good that Berkeley is doing this, but can we, do we have any PR? <laughs> Uh, Th this is a yeah. question that I'm, I'm quite passionate about. It's a very important question. Um, and one faces it all the time when one talks to the public about global warming. And the, the one thing that I emphasize more than anything else is that, yes, there are uncertainties in the projections of what future climate will look like. There's no question, but that our models are not precise. We can't make detailed, accurate, precise predictions. But what's really compelling from all of the science, including some of what you heard tonight, is that the uncertainties are skewed in the direction of the situation being worse than the IPCC projects, not better. If you look at one feedback after another that's not included in the models, these positive feedbacks that the speakers have mentioned, they are such that if we could include them in the model, if we had a, this science developed to the point where we could put them into the climate models, we know that the climate models would be making more dire projections, worse climate change, more hotter future, drier future than what they now project. So that, that is my answer to the skeptics at Fox News and, and the politics is that, yes, there are uncertainties, but if we knew how to narrow those uncertainties, it's not at all uncertain what the outcome would be. It would be more dire projections. Um, question here. Uh, we learned tonight a lot about the uh, carbon cycles. I wonder if there's been much thought given to how climate change might affect the oxygen cycle. Okay. Um, I think <clears throat> somebody want to deal? If not, I will. But <clears throat> Well, just in terms of the amount of, <clears throat> sorry, of oxygen in the atmosphere, we're kind of lucky on this planet, the time that we live in, that there's about 20 percent. It's you know, enough to breathe, not enough that we combust spontaneously. It's, it's just right. Uh, <clears throat> but there's, it could happen. <laughs> just, it would only take a few percentage more. So, but it's actually a lot of, of oxygen. So I may not be totally understanding your question, but, but um, <clears throat> if we were to combust even a lot more CO2, it would be a very small change in the amount of oxygen. All that oxygen gets consumed when you combust CO2, and this fossil fuel emissions would do it. You know, we'll, we'll consume CO2, but it's a very small effect. Most of this, the carbon, the reason we have so much oxygen in the atmosphere is <clears throat> in, in paleo times, organic matter was buried. So we kind of disrupted this cycle of oxygen and CO2 trading off. So you've buried a lot of carbon that left this oxygen in the atmosphere, but most of that can't be burned. It's carrageen and carbonates in, in rock. This question, I believe, could be put to all of you, but I'm going to special to you, Margaret. How much cooperation or input is given to you by the agricultural industry or by the forestation industry, since I see that they probably have a lot in common with what you've given here tonight? Would you yeah. give comment to that, yeah. please? Well, I will say that a lot of the collaborators that we have are supported by USDA, Department of Agriculture, and Forest Service. They're really concerned. 
they're not just concerned, I think they're motivated because ecosystems can be so much part of the solution. So since terrestrial ecosystems are taking up carbon, they're removing it from the atmosphere, and we depend on them for so many services, they're, they're really interested. In terms of industry side, maybe not as much, or just not have as much interaction. I was thinking particularly the private industry side. <clears throat> well, groups like uh, Warehouser, the forestry industry is really interested, very much so. And in part, that's business, because in terms of making biofuels, once you figure out these microbes that break down the tough material that makes wood you know, stay upright year after year, but you get the microbes that can do that, uh, what they grow, they say, hey, we could be growing wood, we can be growing biofuel, it doesn't matter to us, you tell us what the high value is and we'll, we'll go there. So they're, they're really quite interested in it and they're happy for people to come do research in their watersheds. Thank you. Yeah. So we have a question in the balcony over here to the, John, to your right, upper right. Oh, yes. <laughs> I have a question uh, that had to do with how the microflora in the soil affects human health. Mm. Uh, I have heard that our health and our intestinal health and overall um, health is affected because, um, especially in countries that have used their soil for intensive agriculture over many years, like the European soils and the, especially the Indian soils, and new studies are coming out. And if you have any information or comment on that, um, there's some disease that have been particularly linked to, to the depletion. Janet, maybe. Oh, sure. Janet. Okay. I, I, could, I can start to answer that. Maybe Owen wants to jump in too. And uh, the other side of my research works with the intestinal microbiome. Mm -hmm. And so there, there's, there's a lot of intensive research in understanding which microorganisms, for example, live in our in our gut, and, and one thing that um, that is maybe of some concern is the possibility for opportunistic pathogens from a soil environment to, for for example, in a hospital environment. You know, this is an example that I can think of, and where where if you have especially compromised individuals, a normal soil organism that would normally be harmless could in fact colonize such persons. But, but usually this is not an issue because the soil microorganisms were exposed to them every day in our, in our normal lives. And so we've built up an immunity to, to most of those. It's just if something gets off balance, then you can have an opportunistic, uh, normally beneficial microorganism has the chance to, to survive. Um. Hi, my name's Alex. Um, I'm exploring the potential of biochar uh, to improve the fertility of soils. And I'm curious about what the pathways are. Oh, one of the potentials of, or the exciting, exciting parts about biochar is that it lasts in the soil for a really long time. Mm. Um, but when it does go away, uh, how does it go away? What are the pathways by which um, carbon leaves the soil? Why don't you start, yep. <laughs> Oh, maybe I, I, yeah, I, can, I can start with that. So we, we actually have an experiment going on at the moment where we're using biochar. We're, we're all working together in this. Um, where we're asking that exact question, um, how long does biochar last in soil? Um, what are the rates of decomposition of biochar in different types of soils, including this tropical soil with the high rates of decomposition and some grasslands from Northern California? And permafrost. And, perm and permafrost, an active layer in, in uh, other regions. And we're isolating microorganisms, we're identifying microorganisms, we've identified a group of microorganisms that can degrade biochar, and we're actively looking at those mechanisms. We don't know what mechanisms they're using right now, but they're likely the very similar mechanisms that microbes use to degrade structural components of, of plants, which is what biochar is. It's more aromatic, um, but the same enzymes, the same oxidative enzymes that the organisms use to break down lignin would likely be used to degrade biochar. And, and some of what we're seeing, those same organisms, the, for example, the actinobacteria that we're seeing uh, degrading plant litter, are, seem to be also involved in degrading biochar. So we can answer some of your, your question right now, but this, this is ongoing work. Uh, up here. Uh, my question is sort of building on the other two, <coughs> prior two questions is what can you do to increase the flux of carbon into the soil um, in a way that doesn't disrupt our economy totally. 
Are you thinking about agricultural practices or more generally? Um, I'm thinking, I'm, it's a general question. You're very general. Agriculture is obvious, but there might yeah. be other ones as well. Okay. Oh, I'll just throw out something that I, I find pretty interesting. In China, they have huge problems with erosion. And now when they're building new highways, um, they're exploring the possibility of making artificial crusts, uh, biological soil crusts along the, the side of the roads. And so it's a very active area of research in China, how you can stabilize soils. Like here, we, we tend to plant grasses and things like that along our highways. But in these very arid regions, like much of China, you know, the Gobi Desert, places like this, those, those grasses won't grow. And so uh, they're experimenting with how you can uh, make stable mixtures of microorganisms that you can spray on the side of the road and water them for a couple months mm. and stabilize the, the, you know, and they let these pioneers go. And so, it, so you culture these in big vats in the they lab do. and they then do. spray them they from spray the truck onto the, the truck on the road. And wow. so that's something that's carbon that was, you know, in the atmosphere. And as these guys grow, yeah. it becomes, it goes into the soil. So I think it's a, you know, huge opportunity for us. And not only that, but you know, you prevent these dust storms, which yeah. is why they're doing it. I mean, if you've ever driven in a dust storm, you don't know what to do because if you um, you can't see what's in front of you, but you're pretty sure there's somebody yeah. behind you. So <laughs> you don't want to accelerate, yeah. but you don't want to hit your brakes. And yeah. so uh, it's a you know dangerous situation. And also, we talked about with the asthma. Yeah. You know, I, I was at a conference and they said uh, crust is dust. So when it gets trampled, it turns to dust, and that's yeah. what we're breathing. In Tr trampled or when off-road vehicles yeah. destroy the crust in yeah. the desert, which is a huge problem. Probably not in China. Probably, yeah. 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 Probably more hurting. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. Um, over here. Um, th there have been a lot of soils on the planet that have been badly degraded um, in in the tropics, there have been peat forests that have been burned. There's a lot of pastoral land that have been overgrazed. And uh, you know, there have been topsoils lost through bad agricultural practices. Do we have any idea how much carbon could be put back in the soil if, uh, if we were to manage all of those areas uh, consciously? Hmm. Can you come up with an estimate for how much could be put back with the well, crust restoration? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I've tried to, yeah, so, so it would be less than a, probably a tenth of a gigaton, Yeah, I think, um, just to kind of scale it, so, yeah. yeah. I mean, overall, the numbers for, if you just had all better agricultural practice, those numbers, I think they're a little inflated, but it might be 10% of anthropogenic emissions yeah. taken up every year. It's a pretty large number, That's actually. That's the number I see, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> uh, massive reforestation programs could end up storing a lot of carbon, both in the trees, and trees produce what are called root exudates that pump carbon down into the soil, sometimes rather deeply. Another thing that has affected in, here in California the carbon in the soil is the um, invasion of annual European grasses that occurred about 100 years ago and replaced our native perennial grasses. One of my graduate students just finished her PhD thesis showing that in places where the perennial grasses, the natives, still exist, we have higher soil carbon levels. And what happens is the invasive annuals uh, are not as productive. Their roots don't go as deep. So they're not getting the carbon as deep down into the soil. And so it decomposes faster. And the net effect is less carbon stored in our soils. You can see this effect out in the Marin headlands, for example. Um, so uh, managing the plants that live on the land um, is, is a huge part of this. And then agriculture has a potential, maybe for up to uh, sequestering up to 10% of annual emissions, although I think those numbers are quite inflated, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Where uh, are we? Oh. Up here. Oh, the other way. Yeah, that way. Oh, up there. <laughs> ah, you're yes. right in the lights from me. Um, I am a farmer on the central plains of Montana, and I'm both practicing organic and conventional agriculture. Um, my question is 
with organic agriculture, I am doing more tillage to the soil. Yeah. I'm not using chemicals. Um, but I'm also in my conventional egg, I'm using glyphosate. And uh, all of a middle, middle America is using glyphosate right now. And, uh, my question is, what does glyphosate do to the microbes in the soil? Hmm. That's a good question. So, probably everyone can understand, but if you, if you don't use herbicides, then in order to get rid of weeds for planting, you need to till. I mean, that's one way. If you, but if you decide you don't want to till, then you're going to use the herbicides. You have this trade-off. Well, I, all I know about glyphosate is that it is degradable. Um, now, whether it would have an impact, and, I, and I'm sure that there have been studies on the impact, many studies on the impact of glyphosate on soil microbial communities. So, and, and I'm, I just can't, you know, say exactly, you know, I would have to go look at the literature. But, but glyphosate is degradable. It probably has an impact on some members of the community. But uh, I don't know if anybody knows more than that. No. Good question. Uh, up here? That kind of leads to my question, too, is that trying to think about how to explain this to a kid. And it, it sounded like in the desert, when you show the pictures of the desert and it getting damp and um, basically things coming from cowering beneath the, the ultraviolet protection of the sand and then <laughs> surfacing and, and I guess growing or, or you know, um, is there, are there like biomes uh, below us uh, and are they identified? Are there habitats? Um, and is the desert a very, very narrow habitat? and is the tropics a very, very thick habitat? And so how deep is this activity going? That's a great question. Well, I'll start off with the first couple millimeters. <laughs> yeah. so, so the desert crust is, you know, the, the, the microbes that, that I was first talking about are the cyanobacteria. So they're ones that can get access to sunlight. And, and the one, the microcoleus, is one that has this neat adaptation to where it can actually glide along these tubes when it gets wet and find its way up to the surface. And then when it's drying out, it scurries back down underneath the sand. There's other cyanobacteria that are absolutely at the top surface. And they survive by producing lots of sunscreen. Yeah. So they're black. So those, those pictures that I was showing of the dark crust, those had, were just loaded with all of the sunscreen pigments. But as you go deeper down, you start getting below where the light is. So you can imagine diving into the ocean as you're, you know, kind of like you're diving down into the soil. There's no light. And that's where the heterotropes uh, are existing. And they're living off of what is excreted by the mm. cyanobacteria. So you're right. It's a whole little ecosystem. Mm. But this ecosystem may just be the top couple millimeters. Mm. Right. Mm. Well, go deeper. Yeah. Let's go a little bit deeper, yeah. <laughs> My, microbes like to follow plant roots. And that's, that's their source of carbon for the, mo for the most part. Or it's a source of... of freely available carbon. So the further uh, uh, the rooting structure goes down in the soil of plants, the microbes will follow that. And the microbes in the area around the plant root, that's called the rhizosphere, there's roughly about 10 times more microbes there. They're more active. Biogeochemical cycling is much more active near the plant roots. So in, in, to some extent, that the, the depth that microbes go is really related to the, where the resources are in soil. But we, we've studied microbes at three kilometers below the surface of the earth. And there are self-contained ecosystems down there that are independent of photosynthetic energy. So we have pretty much uh, microbes from, from the mantle to, uh, to trench crust. Wow. Yeah. OK. Hi, I was wondering if you know of any work on how increasing temperatures might affect abiotic chemical uh, reaction kinetics. Um, which could possibly change accessibility of carbon to microbes for degradation? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, there's been a lot of really good work on how higher temperatures will affect abiotic chemistry in the atmosphere. Uh, smog formation, for example, and the rest of the chemistry that um, affects air pollution levels. And the calculations that have been done show that Higher temperatures, of course, speed up reaction rates. That's a very general principle in chemistry. And the, the trend is going to be that the, the pollution levels are going to go up under higher temperatures in the air. But you're asking about soil chemistry and water chemistry, I presume. The temperature increase in the ocean uh, is also speeding up certain chemical reactions. And one of the things that's a non-biological effect of higher 
ocean temperatures is that there's more carbon outgassing to the atmosphere. As ocean waters warm, they can hold less carbon dioxide, just like a warm beer goes flat. If you take a cold beer out of the refrigerator and then leave the glass for an hour, it'll have less carbon dioxide. The flattening of the ocean is going to increase the amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's another one of these positive feedback effects that could be very important in the future. But for soil chemistry, I'm going to leave it to you guys. So we've conferred. We <laughs> <laughs> so there are a lot of important abiotic reactions, like organic material coating a mineral surface or aggregates forming, and it makes it very hard for microbes to get at the material. It's one of the reasons carbon persists for so long. But in our, in our deep study, while you were asking your question, <laughs> we, we don't know if there's very much research on it, and I think it would be a great topic. Right, yeah, that's colleague. exactly what I was asking. Thank you. <laughs> okay. we, we do have a colleague. Uh, <laughs> question up there. That's your dissertation. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I just had a quick question. I guess this is more um, directed toward Janet. Um, on one of your slides, you showed a nice cycle of methane and permafrost, um, how methane is being produced and consumed. And I just wanted you to talk about um, how, I, uh, what kind of feedbacks would higher uh, temperatures have on that um, cycle? Oh, you asked the perfect question. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, just, we just had a paper accepted today in Nature that addresses exactly that, that question. <laughs> so if you, if you uh, take frozen permafrost and you, and you heat it, if to, and, and it starts to thaw, what we, see, what we saw in our experiments was that we saw a burst of methane initially, but we did our experiments in closed systems, and so we saw also consumption of the methane after a little bit longer incubation. So we had a little methane cycle in our, in our system here. And, and we identified actually that, that, that graph I showed of that methanogen that produced the methane, we identified that, but also the bacteria that were responsible for consumption of the methane. And so in this example, heating can cause both a release of methane and if the environmental conditions are just right, you can have some of it mitigated and consumed by methane-consuming bacteria. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Vincent, and I, I wanted to say thanks. I'm not a scientist, and so I appreciate you, um, what you said in the beginning, uh, kind of building a bigger sense of ecology to understand some of these topics. Uh, I guess for me, it's been really interesting to hear about these marginal spaces as the places where this carbon is being sequestered. And I guess I've never thought about the crust I've walked on in the desert before <laughs> and, or, or how the permafrost really is counting for a lot. Yeah. And uh, I guess it's been partially answered, but like the question about farming, like how much is the agriculture that people do play up as a part of this? Uh, because I, you know, it sounds like the permafrost is soaking up quite a bit of it. And, you know, we are doing all this work out there um, but it, it sounds like the net effect of all that agriculture that we do is relatively low. Um, and I was in interested to know as kind of a piece of the pie, um, yep. what is our activity? Uh, I'll, I'll let them speak to agriculture, but I, I just want to say in response that the overwhelming cause of global warming is fossil fuel burning. Mm -hmm. And if we don't cut back on coal consumption and oil consumption and natural gas consumption, mm -hmm. Uh, we're not going to solve the problem, no matter what we do in the agricultural sphere. Yeah. But agriculture is very important, and it itself is a contributor, because a lot of fossil fuel consumption goes into food production. Yes. So uh, you're absolutely right about that. But um, when you look globally at the scope of the problem, mm -hmm. um, it, it's fossil fuels is yeah. where it's at, and where we have to make big changes. I, I had another small question. I wanted to know if anybody um, had any idea about uh, genetically modified organisms and if they were creating unique situations or unique, uh, you know, mm -hmm. microbiotic life. Uh, thank you. Um, my, my PhD thesis in the mid-80s was to develop a method to detect genetically mm -hmm. modified microorganisms in the environment. This is when the industries really thought that there was going to be a lot of release of genetically modified uh, organisms into the environment. However, since, uh, since then, this has not been the case, and this is largely, I mean, microbes, because of the regulations, the regulatory restrictions, especially in Europe. 
So really it's a non-issue for microbes right now. One up there. Uh, my name is Maria. I have a second question. I see that um, plastic use and uh, deposits in our oceans are a big problem. Mm. And I wondered, because most of the plastic would actually end up either on the surface or buried somewhere, and, somewhere, and um, how would that have an effect over time, especially the plastic that under UV breaks into tiny and tiny and, and microscopic uh, particles? Unfortunately, a lot of that plastic is ending up in the, in the stomachs of albatross and fish and, and marine life. Um, so it's a huge problem just from the viewpoint of biodiversity. Um, but does somebody want to comment on the abiotic fate of the plastic mm -hmm. and its relation degradation. to microbes? There, there, is, there is microbial degradation. It's just the rate at which it happens is very slow. And that's yeah. why it ends up in other parts of the food yeah. chain. It's a huge hazard to marine life. I wish we could say something more yeah. positive. <laughs> I mean, everywhere we look, I, I just imagine like in, in a billion years, the Grand Canyon will have the plastic yeah. cake layer. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, I think we have a last question here. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is, it's sort of a general question. At the end of the presentation, you mentioned how there's kind of a missing link between the um, bottom-down and top-up approaches to understanding ecology and climate, and especially soil ecology. And I'm wondering what you see as some of the most uh, critical joiners of those two fields. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I can start. Some things that are missing out of current climate models or ecosystem biogeochemical models are explicit mechanisms of microorganisms representing microbes based on the fundamentals we understand of, of their metabolism and the way they perform biogeochemical reactions. And much of the reason for that is that these mechanisms weren't known, or they weren't very well understood. Um, so as we, we gain more information on those, then finding ways of incorporating these into uh, biogeochemical models at a lower level. So th these are not global models, but biogeochemical models that are maybe ecosystem specific at a lower scale. And then using that information to better predict processes at that scale and then scaling up to global scales, I think is, is one way of, in of, of uh, incorporating this type of information and have, making it have an effect at a, at a global scale. Yep. I'd just add that much of what we know about the biochemistry of microorganisms is based on organisms that can be cultured. And most soil microbes, or a large number of soil mar microbes, cannot be cultured. So it's just the void. We don't know. And yet these microbes aren't just a pure culture living in the soil. They're these complex communities of organisms. Just like, a, you know, you look at a forest with trees and birds and all of the flora and fauna. That's what's in the soil. And it's the, how they're all interwoven that is the community itself. And so the desert crust to me is more like a skin on the desert. And it's you know, very much alive and integrated. And yet we don't really know all the pieces of it to put it back together. So I think ultimately having some sort of model of how these microbes co cooperate as a community um, is really critical. Like you started off with your talk to, to understand yeah. it. No, in, in fact, Darwin, in my opening comments, I talked about Charles Darwin and how he was both the astute observer of the detail, that's the, the bottom up level, the fossils and the detailed differences in the beaks of finches on the Galapagos. And then he looked at the sort of top down scale. He didn't have satellites, but he could observe similarities and differences across continents. And these two scales came together and in his mind led to the um, creation of the theory of evolution. And I think that's the, uh, I, I want to come back to my opening comments. I think that's the need and, the, and what we're seeing here are pieces of this story beginning to be put together. But we're a long way still, I think, from putting the top down and the bottom up <laughs> together into a coherent, grand unified theory of the biosphere. <laughs>
So that concludes our evening. Thank you, scientists. Thank you, audience. Uh, we'll be back with Science of the Theater in the spring.